You are listening to 99.1 WQRT LP Indianapolis, and this is Create Here. Produced by artists and curators from Big Car Collaborative, Create Here is your place to listen to conversations with people making intriguing, innovative, and impactful things happen on the cultural front in Indianapolis, Indiana, and beyond. Find out more and access additional episodes at WQRT.org. In this latest episode, Jim Walker sits down with Ernest Disney Britton of the Arts Council. So I am here with Ernest Disney Britton. Vice President of Community Impact and Investment for the Arts Council for the last 10 years. Yes. Welcome. Thrilled to be here. So w- one of the reasons we're talking is f- for, a, I would, I, people use this word bittersweet a lot, but I would say that's accurate. So you're retiring soon, like nine days from nine. now and absolutely bittersweet to love what you're doing today yeah. and know that you won't be doing it tomorrow. Right. But equally excited about what's going to happen tomorrow is just the oddest combination of emotions. Right. And I, w- I want to talk about a few things, but one thing I want to talk about is how you in the last 10 years have really been along and leading in this path that we've been on in our city to really grow in the arts and beyond the arts in terms of including people, thinking about things different ways, connecting with each other. And really it's a whole, to me, it feels like a whole different ball game, not only because of what happened all over the world, but also because of what was happening here anyway. Right. In fact, I use an example of that is that when I came, that was one of the first years that Big Car had been a part of the grants program. Right. And I remember some of the community conversations that were going going around because you guys were groundbreaking in terms of how do you take the arts and make it. There's a sign outside that says you can make art here. Right. Anybody can make art right, here. Right, right. And that was sort of your philosophy. And there was this other sort of historic mentality here in terms of the art sector that only a few people could make art here in the city. Yeah. And so... That did become sort of our charge of how do we make sure that we are making the arts accessible to everyone, not just to view, but to be creators and to sort of step into the artists within all of us. And what I have always seen about you just from knowing you is you're an empathetic person. And I think that empathy that that you show in your life is something that has carried over into the arts and into the arts council. Thank you. I just say thank you. And that because I'm sure you agree that that's really important to try to understand what it's like for other people who aren't you. I think it's absolutely essential to being a good arts administrator. So the the role of an arts administrator is really to advance and preserve arts and culture. And so you have to have your ear to the ground, Mm -hmm. and you also have to assume that this is not about you as an organization or as a sort of a discipline of support, that you are here to help other people. And the only way that you can help others is to listen to them Mm -hmm. and to feel what they're feeling as closely as you can. And so there's been a lot of listening uh, and therefore being a better partner with individual artists and also arts organizations as a result. And you came here from Cincinnati, and yes. which is where Julie Goodman, who's your CEO now, came from too. Yes, we were good friends there. And the whole, you know, I don't think there's ever been the sense of Indianapolis being competitive with Cincinnati, but there's just things that we learn from each other and they're, they're close to each other. Um, when you were there, what were you doing that, and what were you doing before you came here that built, that you built on to do what you've been doing the last 10 years? So I think in terms of Cincinnati as a sort of this old, old city. So back during the slavery era, Cincinnati was the third largest city in the United States. So that's why they have one of the oldest operas, uh, one of the largest symphony orchestras, Uh, They have a United Arts Fund city where they have this deep commitment of corporate support for the arts. Uh, There's even fundraising that goes on in the schools uh, in Cincinnati. And so they have this deep 
sort of old world tradition. And it's also a city that preserves its downtown neighborhoods Mm -hmm. uh, and the architecture. Historic preservation has been a big part of it. But when I came here to Indianapolis, what I also what I experienced was everything was new and energetic and Mm -hmm. it wasn't so much about the old world. It was really about what's happening now and what needs to happen tomorrow. And that's how I see sort of the architecture, the energy in terms of the artists. What I hear from folks in Cincinnati now is that uh, they look forward to coming here. Mm -hmm. But I also used to hear as I was growing up, I used to hear from my aunts and uncles about Indianapolis as the jazz destination. Right. That they were always coming here. And then there was this period of time where music didn't seem to be the dominant voice here in in Indianapolis. And I think that's one of the things that we've seen in the last 10 years is the reemergence of a a really powerful uh, music scene again. And maybe it was, maybe it never went away. Maybe it was just underground. But I think organizations like your own, organizations like ours, but also Musical Family Tree and others have really helped to... Um, get musicians and performing artists out there again. One thing that seems to have been a big part of what what you bring is also this understanding of artists in all these different genres being, and organizations that do that different work, being of equal importance and needing the same love and attention as what might have been something that was elevated above the others before. Yeah, I think that that is a essential thing that we have sought to accomplish over the last 10 years. You know, in 2015, the Arts Council created its equity policy. Mm -hmm. And that was to make sure that our grant making and our artist services were about making sure that we were going the extra step to make sure that everyone was engaged and had the uh, same or equitable access to the same sort of resources and that we were treating, we were not treating uh, sort of the old world like they were the center of the universe, mm-hmm. but they were a part of the universe. And that was a new way of thinking here in Indianapolis. Just like it's still, there's still challenges in, in Cincinnati, uh, but that is a movement that arts councils are making around the country. And I think that we've really led the way in many ways. We bring Grant panelists here, they're always excited about how we are treating uh, not just the old world, but the brave new world right. with the same sort of affection. But we we have to do that because as a community, we are many, many voices, many tastes, many desires. There's this popular belief or old popular belief that there are uh, communities that don't have arts and culture, that there are neighborhoods without art and culture. In truth, there might not have been cultural institutions uh, in those beyond churches. And that's my experience is that I really got involved in uh, drawing uh, and also choir and piano and all of that through the church. The black church was right. my vehicle uh, towards being involved in the arts. But now today we're more of the recognition that every community has artists and creatives, but that we weren't seeing them the same way. And that our work is to make sure that everyone is seeing their creative spirit come to life and be activated in many different ways. And when you do that, you bring more people into supporting and appreciating everything else. So when somebody's on the outside, it's hard to appreciate the stuff that's on the inside. Absolutely. I'm surprised to this day, disappointed um, that it still exists, but surprised to this day of how many people will say, well, I didn't apply to that grant program because I didn't think it was for me. I didn't think it was for the things that I create or the kind of organization uh, that we are. So this is a a black arts organization that's been around serving kids in music education for almost two decades. 
last year they told me, well, we never applied. We'd heard of it, of the Arts mm -hmm. Council. We'd heard of this thing called grants, but we didn't think it applied to us. Well, of course it applied to them. And what we as arts administrators, yourself too, Jim, you've done a really good job of that, is to go out and meet people and invite them in. Right. Because people want to come in, but they don't know that they are invited. And making people feel welcome has to be job number one in terms of arts administrators. When, Ernest, did you get involved in philanthropy and how did that happen? So I don't know if it was exactly 38 years ago, but it was at my first job. Okay. The Cincinnati Arts Consortium. So at the Cincinnati Arts Consortium, a community-based arts organization, multi-arts center, 14,000 square feet, um, and there was dance. And in many ways, it sort of reminds me of Big Car. There was artists and artists and residents, all of those things. There was photography classes. And I remember that there were there was a donor, a black woman who was a Procter & Gamble executive who mm -hmm. came by and she said, um, this, thanks for the tour. This has been wonderful. Well, what can I what can I do to support you? Can I can I make a donation? And I said absolutely. And she asked, "Well, how much do you need?" And I paused and I thought, "Well, I don't know. No one has ever asked me how much they should write a check for." So I thought at the time what I thought was a big number, and so I said five hundred dollars would be great. And she said, "Oh." Okay. And she pulled out her checkbook and she wrote her, her check down. And as she was handing it to me, she said, I thought you would say $5,000 and I would have written that check, but here's $500. And maybe the next time you see me, you'll ask for $5,000. What I learned in that moment was that stop undervaluing yourself yeah. and ask for what it is that you need, but also that you have to do the uh pre-research to figure out what your costs are. I should have asked for $5,000. She would have given me $5,000. Yeah. And that's where my journey in fundraising began because that's been the big part of my career has been in fundraising. Mm -hmm. There at Northern Kentucky University, where I worked with the president in terms of fundraising related to the theater uh, and to the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center, where we raised $110 million, and I directed all the communications for that fundraising effort uh, to here uh, in, in terms of being a grant maker yeah. versus a grant requester. How did that feel for you when you got to start giving money away? So people think it is, it is my dream job. Yeah. When I was in uh, graduate school, I got a chance to interview the senator who created the Michigan Arts Council, and he talked to me about it, and I thought, wow, I would love that kind of job. What I discovered here at the Arts Council is that most of your job is not about giving awards. It is mostly about trying to build capacity and also telling people that they didn't get the award right. and figuring out how they can build their capacity to be more competitive in the future. So how does it feel? It feels great every day to be able to go to work and say, I'm going to help people, uh, help people to realize their dreams and for to help people at their on their journey, no matter where they are in that development. Some people need less help. Right. Uh, and that's OK. And they can maybe get the grant immediately or at least on the time schedule. But other people and those are the folks that I really love working with are those who have the capacity to really be strong uh, grant writers or grant recipients. And for and all of that, I learned so much about the community mm -hmm. and I also learn more and more about the different challenges that artists of different disciplines and also neighborhoods and ages all experience. It's all different and it makes me a better arts administrator uh, and also grant maker. And that links back to the empathy thing where it's not a one size fits all where you understand that it, things are different for different people depending on all these factors. All those factors and more. Right. As you have spent all this time on either side of philanthropy, 
there are so many things about society that are dysfunctional, broken. Do you see within philanthropy, we, it's obviously not perfect. Have you come out of this thinking that it's doing all right? Here are a couple things that I'd like to see happen, or do you feel like it's got a lot of room for improvement? So I think philanthropy, just like every everything else in America, in the world, still needs to catch up to the current times. Yeah. Uh, what we are lucky for in Indianapolis is that we have some of the the biggest and most helpful and engaged uh, funding organizations in, in uh compared to any place else in the city. And when we bring folks here uh, from around the country, they are so envious of the philanthropic resources that we have here. Mm -hmm. At the same time, what we don't have here is sort of this strong individual giving, this sort of capacity for thinking about me as an individual that am I giving 10% of my uh wealth or my gross wealth uh, to to the arts? Am I making donations? Am I collecting art? Am I supporting individual musicians? Uh, what am I doing to invest in the individual careers of those that I think are really important to this city? And so when I think in terms of institutions, in terms of the world of philanthropy, uh, there is a lot of, there's a, sort of a revolution in terms of thinking, in terms of how do you be a more sort of reduce the sort of the cloak uh, and be much more transparent. So that that's happening. Uh, I saw my first foundation where we're witnessing it together. The first foundation, major foundation that I've experienced that intentionally is designing itself to go out of business, the right. Crystal DeHaan Family right. Foundation and uh, redistributing distributing all of that wealth. Uh, that is actually my first sort of hand, firsthand experience with something like that. But it's life changing. I think that everybody will pay attention to that in a, in a big way. But when I was in uh, New York, I was with the Estrella Foundation in New York after being at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center, and I was that was my first role in grant making. Uh, and the Estrella Foundation is where I learned this whole concept of impact grant making. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that is it's well general operating support dollars. Those are the dollars that we provide to Big Car and other organizations here in the city. Those prized general operating dollars that you can use in any way that you need to fix a flood in your basement of your <laughs> of your organization, um, anything that, that you need. Um, but there are also those grants that are, I think project grants often get uh, caught up in the whole idea of you need to do all the uh, particulars related to the project as, a, as opposed to being focused on what the outcome is. Mm -hmm. Are you trying to uh, increase access to kids in terms of K through education? It's been one of our big priorities over the last 10 years. Uh, are you trying to make sure that your funds are being used to nudge board diversity, greater board diversity? When you... When you use your monies to actually achieve goals that have really come about as part of your listening tour and your data and your observations, that's the kind of impact uh, that I think philanthropy is starting to move more and more into. Uh, and they're, the whole bent towards social, social justice is something that I see nationally in a big way as well. But I, I don't want to let go of the whole idea of the individual donor. So... Here in Indianapolis, uh, and I'd say in contrast that to sort of what I saw in Cincinnati, Cincinnati was always big on asking individuals right. to make donations. And I think there's some hesitancy here, and there shouldn't be. Yeah. Uh, there is, this is the city where they should be asking for $5,000 uh, from my, my friend, even if yeah. uh, you even if you are not sure yet. Right. So how did you get, are you, tell us about your own creative stuff. Like what do you do as a creative person? What are some of the things that 
that not only do you love as a as a supporter, but like, what do you like to do to make your uh, yourself as a creative person? So I had to think a lot about that during the pandemic. Yeah, because during the pandemic, things were. I realized I had forgotten what what it is uh, that I that I do. How did I how did I start on this journey in terms of arts administration? So I was a kid who was interested in theater, mm-hmm. but I was also a kid who was interested in writing poetry, and I was a kid who liked to draw and sketch, um, and thought that maybe I would be a cartoonist mm-hmm. because I like comic books. Mm-hmm. Uh, every kid likes comic sure. books. And so, uh, and that is what I used to do to sort of re- relax. And I would, that was sort of my creative side. But I have to admit that the work of being an arts administrator, you sometimes forget your artistic side as you're yeah. trying to really help others. In fact, I was at Asante Children's Theater at their staff retreat. And one of the artists uh, who was sitting next to Deborah Asante at the time, she said, well, I'm an artist, but I'm also interested in being an arts administrator. And how do you do both? And I said, I'm not the person to ask that question. <laughs> right. <laughs> I hope to do that. Um, but I don't do the, a good job at it. So what do I do instead of sort of making? Uh, I certainly read creative fiction. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is, I read more creative fiction than I read historical. Um, I, will, I go to the movies. I go to plays. And last year uh, in May, I got the chance to sort of be in a play for the first time since I was in college. Wow. And that... That saved me. That really saved me. That was when I realized I need to be creating as well. But still, then you start working and there's always one more. There's always one more thing that you need to do as an administrator. So now that you don't have to be an administrator anymore, is that a plan to do more creative things? It really is. So I've thought a lot about, hmm. Do I want to concentrate on plays? Do I want to concentrate on, do I want to be in a choir? Do I want to re-enter into the theater? Um, What I'm going to do first, though, is get on a train the day after I retire Mm -hmm. and just travel the country. And then I will stop and visit arts organizations and and galleries and uh, music venues and just sort of see what's out there. And what's the beauty of that is that I don't have to bring that back to work and sort of dissect it and say, what can we learn from this? I'll just go there to experience it and say, oh, what can I do to sort of reflect back or to um, sort of generate something new just inside myself and that I haven't done since so long. Right. It's it's time for you to do some things for yourself without these other you don't need these other motivations because this is just important for you. Yes. And I got that lesson from watching you and others, Shante and others on their creative renewal journeys. Yeah. So every time that we release a grant application, I fill it out, too, because I want to have a sense of what the. Per, goes to that empathy thing, I guess, yeah, again, yeah. Uh, that I want to know what other people are experiencing. So the first time that I ran the uh, creative renewal program, I have, I know the PowerPoint, I know what I'm supposed to say, but I don't feel it until I write an application for myself. Yeah. And at that time, I said that if I was to receive a creative renewal fellowship, which I knew couldn't happen because I administer the program, uh, that I knew it would be when I retired, I would take this nationwide train trip and I would have a white tablecloth on my table and I would have a boom box with music and earphones. And now I have my phone, my, my iPhone, right. but, um, I've been looking forward to this. It's always been in the back of my mind for 10 years. And a stack of books, I assume. And a stack of (laughs) books. Uh, I just added two more books to that list. 
just this morning, as a matter of fact, and yeah. I keep switching them out. Uh, and these are these are books that I've read a long time ago. So this is two L bombed books, uh, part of the Wizard of Oz series. I yeah. said, oh. I'm going to read one of, I'm going to read both of these two on the train because train rides are, are long. Yeah. That's one of the things that are great about them, right? Yes. Are you, and you're going all the way, I assume, out to Washington State or? Yes. So I'll go from here. First major stop. Well, Chicago, of course. Yeah. Get on the train in downtown Indianapolis, take the train uh, for a day and spend it in Chicago. A uh, friend will pick pick us up and we're going to spend the, the day there. And then we're going to get on the train the next day and head to um, Glacier, uh, Min go to Minnesota uh, and Montana and go to the Glacier National Park uh, in Montana. I've never been to Montana. No, um, It was always on the map of states, but <laughs> I thought, I don't know if I'll ever go there, yeah. but the train goes there. So I'm going there. It'll stop there. I'm going to stop there. And then I'll have the opportunity of going to Seattle and stay there for a few days. Then we'll go to LA and stay there for a few days. Uh, I'll actually do the first time that I've actually gone to the walk of the walk of fame. What is the, where the stars are for uh -huh. uh, the Hollywood stars um, do some silly stuff like that as yeah. well. And then go down to the Southern border, um, stop in New Orleans uh, for a few days and have dinner with a friend there. And she's going to make etouffee. And I'm just so excited. DC, then come back here and then uh, head to Key West for the rest of the fall. Wow. And your husband, Greg, recently retired too. Yeah. That was really the thing that sort of triggered it. Yeah. I didn't think it would. We've been preparing for retirement for a long time now. The mortgage, all of that stuff is all taken care of. And yeah. so we were, when we, uh, when he said he wanted to retire and his parents are getting older and he wanted to spend more time with them. And he said, uh, I think I'm going to retire on May 27th. And I said, okay, great. That's not going to affect me, but I think it's great that you have more time with your parents. And so he, he did. And then we went on vacation for two weeks and I realized that I wanted to spend more days on vacation uh, and that him not going to work sort of said to me, why are you going to work? Yeah, right. uh, and he, in fact, has been to, he's been retired for th three months uh, and he's, he's spent at least four weeks down in Key West without me because I'm up here working. Right. <laughs> um, but that's about to change. <laughs> right. It's a beautiful place down there. And, and from what we were talking about before, you're going to be able to stay in Indiana and in Indianapolis some of the time. Yes. Half and, of the year. Yeah. And, and so and we'll still have the, you around. And it's the opposite of snowbirds. Right. Because uh, what I don't like about Key West is uh, when it's there, when all of the snowbirds arrive, Yeah, that when it becomes the uh, sort of winter destination for everybody who wants to come down there and really party, 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 Yeah, uh, I'm going to be there during the summer months when it gets back to being a tiny city of about 20,000 people uh, who are just the folks that live there, just regular life and going fishing. I haven't gone fishing since I was... In junior high school. Mm -hmm. So I'll get a chance to fish as well. It's and, a big fishing city. Yeah. And it's a play. Uh, that's another activity like riding on a train where it just take your time, right? Yes, indeed. <laughs> that's what I'm looking forward to. It'll be rest, relaxation, but I'm also going to spend um, figuring out the, the ways that I can continue to be an advocate for more BIPOC leaders mm -hmm. to go into the world of arts administration uh, that... There are all these, we're, we're at this stage now um, where there's about 10,000 baby boomers. I'm a baby boomer. I'm 63 years old. I uh, just turned 63 in August and 10,000 of us are uh, retiring every day, which means that there's this giant wave of opportunity for the next generation. But we've also got to make sure that the talent in that, uh, for, so that for that pipeline is as racially balanced uh, as is sort of representation of our city 
fifty percent of our city are um, BIPOC members of the BIPOC community, yeah. um, black and Latino and uh, Asian uh, and multiracial. But our art sector does not reflect that kind of diversity. Uh, there's been a tiny bit of progress, uh, but that will be something that I will uh, commit. That's sort of one of the th three pillars of my retirement um, is rest, creativity, and advocating for more bi BIPOC arts administrators everywhere. It seems like, and I, I'm sure you've thought about this, that in philanthropy in general to encourage all kinds of people of all backgrounds to go into the work that we do, there needs to be a change in the way that we're paid and, you know, in, in an increase in making that an attractive option for you. Cause if you're a talented young person, you have a lot of options, especially if you're hardworking and creative. Absolutely. You know, that is, so the wage equity issue and the benefits has been one of the things that we've had a lot of conversations mm -hmm. about. Uh, and not only you, it's one of the big issues related to the sector. And you heard me mention that also at Start With Art this year, right. uh, how uh, one of the big challenges as we move move forward. I think that is it is hard to sort of tell somebody who's young and talented that they should go into a career where they can make less money mm -hmm. than they could if they went into, and it's not just the for-profit sector where there's, there's money to be made. There are parts of the nonprofit sector where, uh, where wages and benefits are more equitable. And that has to be the shift uh, for, the, for the arts and cultural sector as well. I see that we were just having a conversation with another arts council um, just, just yesterday. I, I really see that um, we will find ways to address sort of the, the health benefits piece first, mm -hmm. um, but the wage differences we need to address as well. Uh, when, when my dad, uh, when I went to school to study arts administration, my dad said, um, what are you studying again? And I said, arts administration. He said, and what is that? And I did my explanation as a freshman of, in college. And he said, huh, and you'll be able to live off of that. And I said, yes, dad. He said, huh? Okay. So after he asked me that every time I came home for a holiday or a break or to do my laundry and he would, I'd stopped mentioning the arts part and I just said management. And, right. he, and he didn't ask me again until I graduated. <laughs> right. And then I got my first job uh, at the Arts Council and he started to see, oh, okay, this is possible. So I, one of the things that I'm really excited about you inviting me to be a part of this call is that I want people to know you can make a good living right. um, in, in the arts. You can prepare for retirement. Uh, in, in the arts, but that there are some unequal spaces within uh, that that sector that, and we need to continue the journey to make sure that there is equal opportunity throughout the sector, uh, really to be able to retire and have a full creative life. And that's one of the things that you'll be advocating for when you talk to these younger people and and have their voices continue to, to bring that to the table as we work on this, because it's, it's unlikely that all this stuff is going to get solved, you know, in the next five, 10 years, it's going to be an ongoing thing to figure out. It is going to be a continuing journey. Um, but one of the things that we, our mantra at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center is that it takes courage, it takes cooperation, it takes perseverance. And Jesus talked about perseverance, too, that there will be poor with us always. And you, that doesn't stop you right. uh, from trying to eliminate poverty. And so the you didn't say it exactly that way. Um, but the that is the goal that we know what the end goal is. And we just do our part to make sure that we are move, advancing and not going backwards. There is this inertia 
kind of thing that says, oh, let's go back to the way it was. Mm -hmm. And we just have to keep fighting against it. That's why I look to folks like you uh, and Oreo and others who are going to keep on pushing forward. And yes, um, while I'm relaxing and also writing poems or painting, who knows, maybe I'll even do a comic book and I'll send you a copy yeah. uh, that I'll that I'll also be advocating for that as well. As you you talk about the future, let's look back a little bit and your last 10 years here in Indianapolis and in, throughout your career, are there a couple things that stand out to you that you're proud of or that, that you feel like, um, not that you just did yourself, but that happened that you were able to be part of that you're really, that you remember as in a fond way. Yes. So many, so many, let me start and I'll also end, uh, here. So I think my fondest memory will be the creative renewal circles mm -hmm. where I got a chance to sit in the room with 40 of the most creative minds in the city and just listening to them share their greatest dreams and also greatest fears um, and to be trusted uh, as a custodian of that information and those, those sort of applications that share uh, some of those deepest wounds and what people are addressing. So that would be one. Mm -hmm. um, and now I'm going to go all the way back to my, uh, an earlier experience where I mentioned Northern Kentucky University. And so uh, Northern Kentucky University, I designed uh, the, uh, there, was, there was a sculpture on campus. It was by Red Grooms, so hugely popular contemporary artist. Um, but it also was uh, celebrating a, a man who had created the film Birth of a Nation. Mm -hmm. So Birth of a Nation is credited to the KKK movement, sort of uh, being a strong catalyst for that. And so there was uh, a lot of anger on campus, but also that anger was mostly amongst black students mm -hmm. and black faculty and white students. Students and faculty were more, oh, you really have to see the art. It's about the art and it's about red grooms and it's not about that movie. It was about a movie way down under, I think, sort of a love story. So we, so I designed uh, with, with student input this campus-wide dialogue uh, and one of the first in terms of using digital uh, communication too, so that people could sort of talk about these uh, sort of safe spaces where people could talk about sort of the issues and explore artistic freedom and also uh, racism uh, and oppression in the KKK. And then the student senate had the opportunity of making a recommendation to the president of what would happen. What I found in that process is that uh, there was sort of this center group of about 11 students, equally balanced, black and white, uh, and they uh, sort of were taking in all of this input and they were the observers and they were the ones that were making a final recommendation uh, to the student senate. And what I saw was that they were listening to each other yeah. and that, in fact, at the end of the process, the black students were were saying, well... We like the idea of keeping the sculpture there so that it can actually be a uh, sort of a, a, a catalyst for conversation. And then the white students were the ones who would reverse their positions huh. and were saying, no, it's got to be off campus uh, and it got to go off campus now. Yeah. And so what I witnessed is that how people change their minds or at least start to see things differently when they're actually listening to each other and si sitting at the same table. Ultimately, the sculpture, uh, the grand compromise was that it was moved to a different location. It was in the center of campus and now it's uh, off to the side by the art department. And so that was a wonderful compromise. And that is one of those sort of that stands out to me and with my belief in interracial cooperation, uh, that we are better when we don't go with things alone, that when we're uh, listening and, and, and working together. And then the third, and I'll, I'll go um, to the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. So the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center, uh, this whole idea of creating a museum on the Ohio Riverfront uh, 
that was really dedicated to this whole idea of, um, of how can we work together for freedom and using art and artifacts as a way of sort of addressing these things. Uh, some of my favorite artists, um, she was a quilt maker, and then she created sort of what she called ragonons, and she would take quilts and fabric and create these incredible pieces of work, uh, and that it's there in the gallery, and that it sort of became a centerpiece for these conversations. But there was nothing like that that had happened in Cincinnati before. Right. And so uh, this whole idea of bringing people like Oprah, but also Dick Cheney, mm. into a room, into a space to create a museum filled with artifacts and stories that really promote this idea that we can do anything if we work together. And so that was my greatest. We traveled all over the country. Um, I had never been on a corporate jet, and they are really sweet yeah. um, <laughs> before that. And I haven't been since, and I don't expect to ever be on one. But we traveled all over the country. And just fundraising on with, with the CEO of Procter & Gamble was just a great experience. And... and one of the things that I've always really enjoyed about knowing you is that your your positive presence when, you know, like, I'll see you somewhere, you'll come down to a show at our space. Uh, I just want to say thank you to you for that, because I do feel like in all the things you just talked about, the positivity that you bring is a way to 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 bridge these gaps or to succeed at fundraising an important project because it, it feels like it's going to happen when you're, when you're behind it. Thank you. That's really kind of you to say. I just try to do my best, and I believe in, I believe in who people tell me that they are or show me that they are. And most people think highly of themselves because they know what that real spark is inside of them. Yeah. But sometimes they need a little gentle rub uh, to let that light shine. Well, I want to thank you for this conversation, Ernest. Uh, we can keep an eye out for your comic books and your poems <laughs> yes. and see you around town in the winter. Yes. yes. And I, I am so excited for you. I know that you'll not be just doing you'll be doing lots of things but you'll be doing the things that that you haven't been able to do so that's a really really good to know thank you very much looking forward to it and thank you for inviting me here it's my first time being on qrt and i usually just look at it through the window that door the glass door so this is exciting um and thank you jim i've really enjoyed working with you thank you Ernest. same here <laughs>